process. Uh, and uh, without further ado, uh, let's uh, introduce our speaker, uh, Sarah. Fabio, would you like to do that? Yeah, sure. So today it's our pleasure to have uh, Sarah Sound as our speaker for the BHI Colloquium. Sarah is an observational astronomer and a member of the Event Horizon uh, Telescope collaboration. Her research centers around the collection, calibration, and analysis of millimeter wave radio observations of supermassive black holes. And she's the leading contrib contributor of the data calibration and imaging effort that led to the very famous image of the black hole released by the EHT in uh, April 2019. So Sarah, please take it away. Thank you very much. So first, um, it's great to be back at the BHI, even if it's virtual. Uh, I see lots of familiar faces. I'm happy to come back and, and present a little bit um, of my work. So I'll be talking today about the, the size, shape, and scattering of Sagittarius A star. Um, unfortunately, it's not EH2 results, even though um, many people are looking forward to that. It's actually um, three millimeter observations at 86 gigahertz. So just to put our 86 gigahertz work into context um, of the Event Horizon Telescope, which I'm part of. So there are uh, a few goals we want to achieve with the Event Horizon Telescope. We'd like to test theories of gravity in the vicinity of a supermassive black hole. Um, we'd like to connect horizon scale physics to launching mechanisms of relativistic jets on large scales and also connect horizon scale physics and dynamics to multi-wavelength variability and flares observed, say, in the infrared or in the X-ray. So, of course, you're all familiar with the Event Horizon Telescope. In 2017, we did our um, observations that led to our now famous image of M87. So, um, eight different um, observatories took place in these observations at six different geographical sites. Um, what we don't talk about much, however, is that our EHT campaign is actually full of a huge multi-wavelength effort. That involves X-ray observatories, infrared, um, uh, TEV observatories, and other radio bands. And um, these uh, observatories actually observe either simultaneously with the EHT or very near in time to study the two um, main targets, M87 and Sagittarius A star. So in my talk, I'll mostly be focusing about uh, on the radio counterpart of the uh, EHT observation and how this multi-wavelength effort actually links to our horizon scale um, studies with the EHT. So of course, uh, you're all familiar with the first image of a black hole. This is the image of M87 taken with the EHT at 230 gigahertz. So you'll notice that we have you know, this bright ring of light and a dark spot in the center. Um, the image is quite fuzzy because our resolution is 20 microseconds and the size of the ring is about 42 microseconds. Um, so using GRMHD simulations um, of uh, the accretion flow around the supermassive black hole, we were able to, um, to scale up this um, uh, mass to uh, shadow size relation and actually measure a mass of the black hole. Um, so before our observations, there were actually two masses for the black hole, one derived by gas dynamics and one by a stellar, um, um, stellar measurements and they were actually about a factor of two apart. Um, so we measured the mass of the black hole to be um, six and a half billion solar masses. So matching the um, stellar dynamics um, measurement, which is six billion solar masses. Now, this me mass measurement has an uncertainty to it. This uncertainty is part due to our library of GRMHD simulations, which actually involved um, lots of different um, theory models that could apply to our image, um, and also um, uncertainty in the distance of the black hole. Um, so in order to reduce this uncertainty and actually have a good measurement of the mass and thus um, a more accurate measurement of the shadow shape, we would need to know the, um, the distance more accurately to the black hole and also know its um, uh, emission mechanism very accurately. Now, um, what we could find as um, predictions of general relativity from M87 black hole is that our shadow is about circular to within 10%, which is consistent with GR, um, but it's not accurate enough to find, um, say, to measure the spin of the black hole 
or to find any deviations um, from GR um, with theories that only have very small deviations from circularity. So um, imagine if we had a perfect source, a perfect black hole, that we know its mass and distance very accurately, and we knew its emission mechanism, um, then we'd be able to um, image its shadow with high accuracy and measure um, the shape of the shadow with high accuracy. So knowing the distance and the mass, uh, Einstein's theory of gravity gives us an exact um, prediction for what the shadow looks like, and we'd be able to observe it with the EHT. Now, um, fortunately, there is actually a source that is just like that, and it's Sagittarius A star, the black hole at the center of our own galaxy. So Sagittarius A star is the closest supermassive black hole to us. Um, its mass and distance are known incredibly accurately thanks to the stellar, um, the S star measurements done um, by the Keck UCLA group and the gravity team. Um, so most recently, Gravity Collaboration published new measurements for the mass and distance with up to about a percent accuracy, which is incredibly accurate. Um, so we actually know what Einstein's theory of, of relativity predicts um, for the shape of the shadow in Sagittarius A star exactly. Um, but we don't really know what is the orientation of the black hole, um, if it's spinning or not, and what the emission process is. So in order to actually test general relativity for Sagittarius A star, we need to answer these questions. So um, we have an expected size of the shadow of Sagittarius A star, which is about 50 microarc seconds. That's been observed in previous observations of the EHT. But in order to answer these other questions, we also need a multi-wavelength reference. Um, so the next step is then to figure out um, what Sagittarius A star looks like at 230 gigahertz and what we can learn from it via multi-wavelength observations. So this is um, the spectral energy di distribution of Sagittarius A star. So there's um, frequency bottom, and this is um, flux and Jemsky um, on the y-axis. Um, this part is the radio and millimeter band, and then here is the infrared um, flux for Sagittarius A star. Now the radio and millimeter band um, has the slope. Over here, there is a turnover at the terahertz level. This is where um, the gas becomes optically thin. EHT frequency is around here in the millimeter band, um, right where it becomes optically thin, so we can see the shadow. Now this part um, is actually um, very interesting because um, although the emission mechanism for the radio um, emission for Sagittarius star is still not really understood, whether it comes purely from the accretion disk or accretion flow, or whether there's an actual jet, which we haven't observed yet, this radio part is actually extremely hard to fit with, um, with theoretical models that don't include some sort of outflow or jet. However, we've never seen an outflow or jet in images of Sagittarius star in the, uh, in the radio. So this leaves us with a lot of uncertainty as to where this radio emission comes from. And if it's um, not an outflow or jet, how can we explain this, um, um, this spectral energy distribution? And if it is an outflow or jet, how come we don't see it in the images? So um, if we look at one millimeter, which is where we observe uh, with the EHT, the shadow is actually the dominating feature. So if you were trying to look at differences between an accretion disk dominated um, emission mechanism or a jet dominated emission mechanism, um, and you were to image these with the EHT, you would see pretty similar images because we have pretty low dynamic range and we would really see only a kind of crescent and then a dark spot in the center uh, where the shadow lies. Same for the jet model. Now, because the shadow is such a dominating feature and we're, we wouldn't be able to pinpoint differences in the accretion flow, we'd need to kind of zoom out and see a little bit further into the accretion flow to see um, major differences. So if you zoom out, you end up at three millimeters. And there, um, we actually start to see um, differences in the accretion flow. So an accretion disk dominated flow would look more symmetrical and kind of um, round. And the jet dominated one would be very extended and with a lot of flux. This is because now at lower frequency, the gas is more optically thick. And so we can see it more clearly and it has um, more flux. So three millimeters would be the perfect place to actually um, differentiate between these different emission models. 
And it's also the perfect place that can still be accurately simulated by a GRMHD simulation. As you go um, at longer wavelengths, it becomes a little bit more difficult to simulate right now with our state-of-the-art simulations. But unfortunately, because Sabe Star is in our galactic center, we have another problem, which is interstellar scattering. So um, we're subject to interstellar scattering, which actually gets stronger with increasing wavelength. So at three millimeters, this is what the two models would look like if we add our, um, our scattering based on our knowledge of it right now. So it would look like this. The accretion disk dominated model and the jet dominated model look pretty much the same. So we're back at square one where the scattering completely obscures all kind of traces of um, the accretion flow differences between the two models. Fortunately though, because the interstellar scattering is chromatic, we can actually study it across multiple wavelengths. So we can use longer wavelength information in the radio to learn about the scattering and um, remove it and then recover our intrinsic structure that could tell us about it, uh, the emission mechanism in Sagittarius A star. So what have we learned so far about the scattering? So by looking at longer wavelengths, we found that the scattered size um, of Sagittarius A star scales as lambda squared. So here is a wavelength in centimeter, which is the width half max size um, of, the, of the source on the sky. So in, um, you can see the lambda squared relation here. And in the longer wavelength regime, the uh, scattering actually dominates um, the source morphology. And as you go to shorter and shorter wavelengths, scattering becomes smaller and smaller. And then the source becomes, um, the intrinsic source dominates the source morphology at very short wavelengths. So at 3.5 millimeters, which is right this point here, um, the intrinsic size becomes comparable to the effect of the scattering, which we call the blurring kernel, which blurs the source and stretches it in the east-west direction. And then at one millimeter, the intrinsic size dominates. So we actually start to see um, intrinsic source detections on very long baselines, so very large telescope spacings or high resolution. This is um, what we found in the 2013 observations um, of, uh, of Sagittarius A star, where there were very long baseline detections that actually told us that the source was resolved on those scales and not completely um, resolved out or blurred out by the scattering. Um, what we also found is that in the, known, in the centimeter wave, um, at 1.3 centimeters, there are actually these um, long detections, uh, long baseline detections that don't come from the source. And these are what we call refractive noise. And they actually come from substructure in the scattering screen um, that, cause, um, that cause you know, small scale detections in, um, in, the, in the Fourier space. However, this refractive noise is actually contamination from the scattering. It's not actually intrinsic source structure. Um, but um, up until 2017, they were only detected in the centimeter wave. So we don't know what they look like at one millimeter, for example, for the EHT. So how do we extrapolate this behavior to shorter wavelengths? Now there's actually more to worry about because depending on the scattering theory, this um, refractive uh, scattering may contaminate the tests of GR we want to do with the EHT. So let's look at the two models we have so far. Say we have a simple ring at 1.3 millimeters and we scatter it with two scattering models. Um, they both have the same blurring behavior, um, so same what we call diffractive scattering, but they have different refractive scattering or this kind of substructure in the image. So we have this Johnson 2018 model, which has um, near Kamal Gaurav um, power spectrum for these fluctuations in the uh, interstellar medium. And if we were to scatter this ring with this model, we'd get something like this. So we'd get the ring that is mostly stretched in the east-west and then ripples on top of it that is very low level of this um, substructure or refractive noise. Then there is another model based on this um, paper by Goldreich and Shridhar. Um, and if we were to scatter it by this model, it would look something like this. So you could see it's still it's stretched in the east-west, but the um, the substructure is really, really large and creates these huge variations in the image. And there, the ring is practically not recoverable. So if we were to be susceptible to this GSO6 model, 
Uh, testing DR with the EHT images will be extremely difficult. Now, luckily, you know, interstellar scattering is chromatic, so we could learn about these two scattering models or differentiate them with another frequency or wavelength. So if we were to go back to 3.5 millimeters and look at these two models, so they both have the same diffractive blurring, which is you know, a source stretched in the east-west. Um, but if you were to look at it um, in, uh, also with refractive noise, with refractive scattering, it would look like this. So if we actually had a 3.5 millimeter instrument that had baselines long enough um, to actually pick up this small structure in the scattering screen, we could actually tell these two models apart because they would have very different substructure. The J18 model would have very low level detections and the GSO6 model would have very, very high levels of detections on those long baselines. Now, um, at 86 gigahertz, up until 2017, we had no baselines above um, one giga lambda. So very short baselines in the array. Um, so what we've observed is basically a scattered source that looks pretty much Gaussian, and it was stretched in the east-west. Now, in order to get non-Gaussian structure, you would actually need to resolve um, smaller, um, uh, smaller structure in the image, and so we'd need longer baselines. So um, for any kind of source, if you are looking at short enough baselines for a compact source, you would always see a Gaussian unless you would actually resolve um, some of the structure. So here's an example of um, three different sources. Here's a Gaussian and a Crescent and a GRMHD simulation. Um, if you look at short baselines, they all follow this kind of Gaussian falloff. It's because the um, source morphology is dominated by the second moment of the visibility um, amplitude function. Um, then as you reach long baselines, you can actually start to see differences in the different models. So the Gaussian just goes flat, and then the Crescent and GRMHD simulation starts to pick up um, different um, signal from the small scale structure on long baselines. So we need to get a three millimeter array that could pick up on these differences and tell us whether the source is Gaussian or whether it could pick up on non-Gaussian structure, um, either from scattering or from the source itself. So, um, let me present to you the global millimeter VLBI array. So the GMVA is a um, global array similar to the EHT, but observing at 3.5 millimeters. In April 2017, we had the first campaign with ALMA, also taking part in the GMVA. So it's made up of European facilities, the Very Long Baseline Array, the Green Bank Telescope in the US, and an ALMA um, that was equipped for VLBI by the ALMA phasing project. Now ALMA is really a game changer. Because so far with the GMVA, we only had east-west kind of oriented um, telescopes. And the east-west uh, direction is where the source is blurred out the most. So it's very hard to pick up on um, intrinsic structure. And so ALMA adds this kind of north-south um, baselines and also long intercontinental baselines to the US, um, Hawaii, and um, Europe. So it was truly a game changer for us um, when it joined the GMBA, so Alma is down here. So um, on April 3rd, 2017, actually th two days before the EHT campaign started, we observed Sagittarius A star with the GMBA and Alma. We observed for about 12 hours. Um, we had 13 participating stations. Of course, we don't have the bandwidth of the EHT, um, but it was good enough to get um, lots of interesting science out of it. Um, we did data reduction with the EHT Hobbs pipeline, which is the primary pipeline for the EHT M87 results. Um, and we also did the imaging with the EHT imaging library developed by Andrew Shale, um, which is also one of the three pipelines used for the M87 results. Now here are the results for, um, for our 2017 observations. This is baseline length, so um, telescope spacing, short spacing um, uh, are um, large scale structure, long spacings are small scale structure. This is flux density. Um, so here are our detections. Anything before this gray line here is basically the kind of Gaussian behavior previously detected with the GMVA and other three millimeter experiments. Everything past this line is actually new and is detections to ALMA. 
um, plotted here in yellow um, the, the uh, major axis and minor axis falloffs for a Gaussian, so the Gaussian that was measured in previous experiments. Now, what we can note here is that all the baselines actually tells us so much more information about the source than the previous simple you know, Gaussian assumption. So the first thing that it tells us is this particular baseline here. This baseline is ALMA to the Green Bank Telescope, and it's incredibly sensitive. So ALMA had phased um, 35 dishes to make a super you know, mega dish of 17 meters aperture, and the Green Bank Telescope itself is a 100 meter dish. So incredibly sensitive baseline. It's so sensitive that you can't even see the error bars on these points. And what it tells us is that um, this baseline lies along the minor axis of the source but it actually has flux in excess to what we would expect from a purely Gaussian source, which is this yellow dashed line here. So already the alma GBT baseline tells us there is non-Gaussian structure there. Um, and these other baseline detections over here are alma to the very long baseline array. And these detections are um, quite you know, long and flat and um, they mimic or look like refractive noise. And so if we were to place these detections in, um, in context of the levels of refractive noise we'd expect from those two scattering models, the J18 model lies over here, and the GSO6 model, this one with huge variations, um, lies up here. So our ALMA detections already tells us that we have you know, non-Gaussian structure over here too, um, but that it's more consistent with the J18 um, model than with the GSO6 model. Now, what did we do? Um, once um, we, uh, we found that the J18 model suited our observations best, we tried to use it as the scattering model to reconstruct an image. So we wanted to reconstruct the unscattered image, what is the intrinsic image behind the scattering screen. Um, so we used a technique um, developed by Michael Johnson called stochastic optics where um, we can input information about the diffractive blurring of, a, um, um, of the scattering. So here you can see how this model gets stretched in the east-west. And then refractive noise, which adds these kind of ripples in the image. So um, we, we solve for the scattering using the scattering model that tells us that there's a scattering kernel and a stochastically varying refractive noise. We solve for these stochastic variations in the screen and then deconvolve the image then with the scattering kernel to get a final intrinsic image. So this is our scattered and unscattered image that we got. Um, the unscattered image is about 120 by 100 microseconds, um, which is fairly symmetrical. And um, we found um, no um, apparent asymmetry in closure phases in our data set. Um, so the emission was about um, 12 short shield radii from the black hole at 86 gigahertz. So now that we have an image, um, we could actually compare it to what we expect from simulations. So we asked this question, um, if we had a, you know, a kind of more jetty kind of image, a more elongated one, would we actually be able to, to, to image it properly um, with our array and actually reconstruct something more elongated or would we get something compact no matter what the intrinsic image was? So we did tests with GRMHD simulations, um, ones that look more compact, so more kind of disk models or jets that are pointed um, you know, almost towards us, um, and then more elongated jet-like models. We applied a scattering screen uh, model on top of it, and then reconstructed an observed scattered image and then a reconstructed intrinsic image exactly the same way as we did for the, um, for the real SIDA star data. And we found that um, no matter what the input uh, model was, we would reconstruct a similar asymmetry um, to the original model. So if it was a jetty feature, we would have reconstructed a jetty feature in our image. So then we tested against uh, different um, simulations, um, varying either electron acceleration in disks and jet models, or also different electron heating prescriptions and spin. And we found um, that if the emission were to be jet dominated, um, the emission would have to be face on, so less than 20 degrees um, inclination. So high inclination jets were completely ruled out um, by our image. 
um, and disk models would actually fit um, in various inclinations. So then we went back in 2018 and decided, you know, we have these um, detections of non-Gaussian structure inside a star, but how persistent are they? Um, was this just a one-time thing that we actually got the success um, on Alma GBT? What about their refractive noise? What can it tell us um, about um, the underlying model? Because of course their refractive uh, properties are stochastically varying. So it could have been that we just had, you know, a low realization of, of this other, you know, GSO6 model. Um, or that it was indeed the J18 and the level of refractive noise is just consistently low. So we went back in 2018 to observe again, and we observed two days um, separated by um, three days in between to explore different properties of the sc uh, scattering screen, um, especially you know, how dynamic, um, what are the dynamic properties of the refractive noise. So we observed on April 14 and April 17, 2018. Unfortunately, we lost the GBT in April 17, so our detections are not as great as, 20, um, as 2017. But we could still learn some stuff. Um, so here are our observations. Same kind of plot as before, except now our 2017 data are in white, and then the 2018 ones are in um, yellow and blue. And the major and minor axis Gaussians are the same as before. Um, so here's our ALMA GBT baseline, and you can see the white ones are the ones I showed before for 2017, and these yellow ones are the new ones. And you can see that the yellow ones, the 14 April uh, 2018, lie pretty much at the same level as where the 2017 data were. So the flux success on ALMA GBT is still present in 2018. So there is, again, persistent non-Gaussian structure in Sagittarius A star. And then our long baseline detections, once again, match the J18 model and not the GSO6 model. So um, what we could do is actually take our ALMA GBT measurement and say, OK, so we have this flux on ALMA GBT. Um, what can it actually tell us about the source size and the intrinsic, um, the intrinsic source size and the um, scattering parameters? So there are um, two parameters in the scattering model. The power law index alpha, um, which governs the, um, um, the power spectrum in the uh, scattering screen, is inner scale of the, um, of the turbulence in the interstellar medium. Um, so if we combine three millimeter results with longer wavelength constraints from um, this Johnson 2018 paper, we could actually learn a little bit more about our intrinsic source. So um, just to go through this plot a little bit, uh, this is um, here are plotted the different um, parameters, uh, parameter ranges expected for a specific source size to give the measured flux density we get on ALMA GBT. So um, for a source that is 120 microseconds on ALMA GBT, um, only these uh, ranges of parameters um, of the scattering screen would match. And then in blue here are um, constraints from longer wavelengths, from 13 and 7 millimeter um, wavelength constraints. And um, these are the ranges of parameters that were um, uh, still valid according to um, this paper. So there is actually a very narrow range of, um, of uh, parameters that match between the 3 millimeter measurements and the uh, longer wavelength constraints. And what uh, this region actually tells us is that the source size on ALMA GBT for the intrinsic source should be about 100 microseconds, which is consistent with our image. So we also did direct modeling over three millimeter data um, to find what kind of parameter ranges would the data itself give us. So we did modeling in the, in the CEMIS um, uh, MCMC um, modeling package and there, um, we again uh, fitted for this inner scale um, and this power law index. And what it told us is that, uh, oh, and also the source size parameters. So we simultaneously fitted for the scattering screen and for the intrinsic source. Um, and what we found is that the source size along the minor axis is again about 100 microseconds um, fitted by Themis. 
And then the scattering parameter space, which is this blue, uh, this uh, purple part, actually overlaps with our longer wavelength constraints. Of course, it's not as constraining because um, we don't have as many um, detection. It's also um, a single data set, only our 2017 data. But what's really encouraging is this overlap and also the consistency in the source size measurement between the prediction um, at longer wavelength and what we actually fit directly to the thermometer data is that a single scattering screen model can actually explain behavior in both the centimeter and the millimeter regime for Sagittarius A star. Um, then we combined all our long baseline uh, measurements of this refractive noise, um, the substructure, to estimate the power from these modes that we probe at three millimeters in the scattering screen. Um, and the power at three millimeter is actually consistent with the J18 model, um, which is this point here. So this is um, um, the, the scale um, probed in centimeters, and this is the, the power on those baselines. Um, and these are different constraints in the centimeter regime where refractive noise was previously detected. And this is the added constraint from our 2017 and 2018 measurement. And we see here that it um, fits the J18 line, which is this yellow one, and it's well below this dashed line, which is the GSO6. And we're actually measuring here modes that are probed by baselines of the EHT. So we're actually measuring you know, um, refractive noise that can affect our EHT images. Um, which is um, very interesting because now we're actually learning about scattering in the regime that would actually um, come into um, our EHT imaging. So all the detections at 3 millimeters in both 2017 and 2018 rule out this GS06 scattering model for Sagittari Sagittarius A star. This is super encouraging for EHT science because we don't have to worry about these horrible um, deviations. So in the future, we'd like to extend the GMVA plus ALMA to more sensitive stations, um, hopefully increase um, sensitivity on longer baselines to Europe and Hawaii as NOEMA comes online, JCMT obtains a three millimeter uh, receiver, higher sensitivity in the north-south direction with the um, uh, recovery of LMT as part of the GMVA and also perhaps the haystack um, 37 meter um, and then obtain you know, highly sensitive triangles with all these um, sensitive stations for time domain analysis of closure phase variability because in the accretion flow, um, we can also um, study you know, flares and orbiting features that are also on scales of um, features uh, resolved by the gravity experiment. So about 10 Schwarzschild radii from the black hole. Um, so, our 86 gigahertz results you know, add an additional building block to our view of Sagittarius A star that can directly feed into um, both the scattering and the intrinsic source and radio emission knowledge for the EHT um, imaging and um, science. So the size of Sagittarius A star was found to be compact and about 12 Schwarzschild radii in size. We obtained a fairly symmetrical morphology that ruled out you know, highly elongated um, jets at the high inclinations. And the scattering um, helped us rule out this GSO6 model. Um, and the J18 model um, still persists and passes all tests so far. This gives us good prospects for the Event Horizon telescope. So that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for this very interesting talk. So let's see if there are questions. Ramesh, of course. <laughs> Sarah, that was a great talk. Thank you. Very interesting results. So I was, I guess I knew this before, but today from your talk, I was struck by this extra power in the visibilities for ALMA GBT baselines. Yeah. As you said, those are really significant detections there's no error, nothing. And it's significantly above what the scattering model would predict. So what exactly is it telling us? Where is that extra power coming from? Uh, yeah, so it's actually, it's, it's not what the scattering model predicts. It's what the, the Gaussian fit um, predicts um, from before 2017. So before our 2017 measurements, we only had short baseline observations. And so um, 
all, there's always been you know, a model fitting of a Gaussian. And this Gaussian um, size is what's plotted here. So the scattering model actually can fit the ALMA GBT baseline. If we have a fairly compact source of about you know, 110 by say 140 microarcseconds and um, a, a um, non-Gaussian scattering model, a scattering kernel, which is what, uh, what the J18 model has, then we can actually fit this, um, um, this baseline here. Because the, the scattering kernel in, in the J18 model is also non-Gaussian. So there is a kind of a shallower fall off than a Gaussian, uh, than a Gaussian behavior. Okay, so I, what you're saying is that what you've called the minor axis here is for a very simple Gaussian prescription and the proper calculation, you can actually make the line go through the ALMA GBT points. Yes. But then I'm kind of worried about these other points which are way below, right? Those blue points for similar baseline length, yeah. which are way below. So how, why would they be so much below? when we are still inside the scattering kernel. That's right. So these other baselines are not exactly along the minor axis. So they're actually slightly, um, I guess, slightly diagonal because they're on baselines alma to the VLBA. So you're not exactly probing the minor axis. So of course, as you go, you know, more and more um, across your source towards the major axis, you will get lower flux. Yeah, great, thank you. All right, so the next one from Jonathan. Um, hi, hi, Sarah. Uh, also hi. a great talk. And, and, and I'm also, it's, it's so interesting, this three and a half millimeter work. Um, I'm also interested in the ALMA GBT uh, results that, you know, that are in excess. Um, I think my point is better made, actually, if you just look at the two, 2017 uh, only uh, a plot that you sh it just shows what I wanted to ask a little bit more clearly. And, and again, uh, as, as Ramesh emphasized and as, as you did as well, there's, there's no random error in those points. And yet there is significant scatter. And so there's some systematic reason why those points are bouncing up and down rather than, than random noise. I mean, you can see there's a significant excess as well. That's I can... Right. The two possible reasons for the scatter. The one possible reason is the is is it's due to scintillation or scattering in the interstellar medium, and the other possibility is it has to do with atmospheric uh, perturbations of the observation. Uh, but maybe there's something else as well. What is the cause of the scatter in those points? So I would think these systematics come from um, it's possibly miscalibration. So both in amplitude calibration ah. and in uh, telescope operational calibration, say pointing or focus. Um, so the GBT is actually operating at its limit. At, um, its, um, ah. at 3.5 millimeters is also its frequency limit and also observing side a star is its elevation limit. Um, so ah. there is some fluctuation here and we actually ah. chose not to apply any um, self calibration to only GBT based on texts ah. with calibrators we found that the amplitude level seemed to be okay. But of course, individual differences between different scans can cause, uh, can come from this kind of operational miscalibration issues. Yeah. Oh, okay, oh, well, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. And then um, you, you know it not to be either of the two hypotheses that I, that I threw out. It's, it's, it's a measurement, it's an observational, it's a telescope based instrument error. Yes, I think it's more likely to be an instrument error than anything else. Yeah. How, how interesting. Yeah, they, they, the, the observations are all at different elevations as well. And an EBT is at its elevation limit and you're taking it a little bit lower and a little bit higher, then of course it is going to, it's pointing will bounce around yes. quite crazy. Okay, yes. thank you. Next one from Shep. Hey, uh, can you hear me, Sarah? I can. Okay, great. No, lovely talk. Lovely talk. Uh, I, I had a question about the the Hawaiian baselines. So it doesn't seem as though we got any detections to the VLBN Mauna Kea. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So 
and I saw that you had JCMT as an added potential site in the future, yes. uh, which could give you a more sensitivity, although the VLBA dish is larger. So the, the first question I had is, given the models, how far short are we for detecting something at Mauna Kea? How much more sensitive would we need the Mauna Kea dish to be in order to guarantee, given what we know, detections? Um. So based on what we know, I think um, I think what we can detect on on east west baselines is scattering substructure on those scales, just because the source is so heavily scatter broadened in the east west that it's probably very difficult to detect intrinsic structure. But we can learn about the east west scattering, and that would be really useful for the scattering model um, um, predictions and testing. Um, so the scattering level for um, the east-west, um, so let me see. So the J18 model here, um, this level is for the minor axis uh, direction. So for the major axis, it would actually be higher. So it, uh, we expect a little higher flux in the substructure uh, in the east-west direction. So I wouldn't say we need like an ALMA dish <laughs> or ALMA array in Hawaii um, to, to get these detections, but I think um, if we could get the JCMT, for example, operating with the EHT bandwidth, <laughs> we could probably get it, I think. Uh, we could probably detect uh, um, this east-west um, scattering substrate. Okay, and, and, and I guess that, that would mean that the other dishes would also have to have commensurate high bandwidths as well. Some of them, yes. Um, so if you look at the... <clears throat> Um, if you look at this um, array, um, right, we could have, you know, say JCMT to LMT um, east-west detections um, with the high bandwidth array. Yeah. yeah, I think it would be it would be incredibly useful to have high bandwidth observations at three millimeters, um, both both to uh, detect scattering substructure and also to get polarization detections at three millimeters, which would be incredibly interesting, also to rule out. Um, emission models. Yeah, yeah. It, it would be very useful to think about some individual experiments we could run with high bandwidth single baselines that would nail some of that down. The, the, the related question I had was um, in the three millimeter band, typically a lot of receivers go, go up to 115 gigahertz. And, and I thought the VLBA may go up that high. Is, is it useful to think about doing 86 gigahertz, which is, I think, what, uh, the central band for the observations that were carried out here, and also doing 115 to stretch the bandwidth, uh, to stretch the effective baseline in lambdas a bit, to, to populate some of the mid-ranges of the, of the graphs you showed? Um, I think that would be interesting to do. I'm not quite sure um, if, if the frequency, um, ranges actually line up for all the GMBA stations. I okay. Think, yeah, if it was VLBA only, then I think it can be done, um, but then we wouldn't get the long baseline uh, detections. Okay, it's something to think about. I, I thought ALMA was, was somewhat flexible and the LMT I know has a very wide band. ALMA is flexible? <laughs> I, I, I thought they could be. Um, so I think in, in currently band three only goes to 100 gigahertz. I oh, I see. Okay. In that case, uh, probably can't do that. All right. Well, just uh, something to think about because uh, these bands sometimes have some frequency agility in them and, and it's low frequencies. I can't believe I'm saying low free, 86 gigahertz is low frequency, but at, at 86 gigahertz going to 115 would give you, a, you know, many tens of percent increase in effective yeah. resolution. Yeah, that is true. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, something Thanks. to look into. Thank you. So next one, Peter. Oh, thank you, uh, Sarah. Really nice integration of considerations of noise and the multi-wavelengths and so much else. Uh, I just want to continue the conversation you were just having with Shep about uh, bandwidths. If we had in the EHT network, uh, higher or much higher uh, frequency, 
uh, would that give us, um, how much difference would that make if we were at 345 gigahertz or even higher, thinking about the future? With the EHT? Yes. Um, if you combined the other materials that you've talked about in the radio, 86 gigahertz and so on, with an EHT in the future that could go to 345 gigahertz or higher, would that uh, make a big difference in answering the questions that you posed here? Yeah, I think, I think going up to 345, of course, will increase the resolution of our EHT images. So we'd be able to make sharper images of the shadow. And so um, by combining our multi-wavelength knowledge of the accretion flow of Sagi star, we can make more accurate measurement of, say, deviations from GR or spin measurement for the black hole. So that's why 345 is super interesting. In terms of um, in terms of differentiating between different emission mechanisms, of course, 345 is even more shadow dominated than 230. Um, so we would really not see any big, you know, features um, of the disk or jet at that frequency because we're much closer to to the event horizon than at 230. Um, so for that particular goal, 345 would not be useful, but um, definitely for, for the precision imaging, um, that's the place to look. Um, and then combined with multi-wavelength knowledge of the black hole um, accretion flow, we can really test GR um, much more accurately. Yeah. All right, and Eric. Eric? Yeah, just I had to unmute the thing. So um, I have a little question about these scattering models. So you have a G model and a J model. Uh, do these, wh why are these models particularly significant? I mean, could there be an H and an I model or a K or G and J bracket those? Or what, what is, um, why, why do you concentrate on these two? Um, so I think there can definitely be a G and J bracket uh, model. Um, I think we have uncertainty in the scattering parameters because there's uh, degeneracies in them and also degeneracies in the scattering model and the intrinsic source structure. Um, so we would actually really need um, obviously more frequent observations and more multi-wavelength coverage to break those degeneracies between the models. Uh, these two models in particular, I think they show um, just very two very different um, views of the, of the scattering. This GSS-6 model in particular um, has a you know, flat spectrum for this, um, these fluctuations in the interstellar medium. And although at longer wavelengths they look the same, at shorter wavelengths they are clearly different. Um, so the reason we picked these two is that these two models um, fit all our longer wavelength observations up until now. Um, and it was only three millimeters that was able to actually break uh, the differences between these two. And then, of course, the um, ongoing work um, is now you know, this kind of work to, to really um, narrow down on these different parameters that are, you know, have some degeneracies in the J18 scattering model um, so that we can actually pinpoint you know, with more accuracy what the specific parameters are. Um, and then um, and then actually hone down on the specific um, intrinsic source properties as well. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. I think so, so the so the G model is sort of a flat spectrum, and the J model then is not. It's a yeah, it's near a Kolmogorov. But, um, but the so the J model has has uh, specific um, parameters kind of estimated based on longer wavelength observations of Sagittarius A star. Um, but of course, these um, parameters have you know, uncertainties and um, there are degeneracies in the model itself. So we're now observing more uh, three millimeter and at longer wavelengths to try to break these degeneracies and narrow down the parameter space for these, um, for these specific parameters. And then really have you know, kind of universal model to explain the scattering um, more accurately. Would, would a power law model also fit? We have Kolmogorov and a G 
energy and a flat, and then how about a power law? The Kolmogorov is a kind of a power law. Yes, yeah, so they're both power laws. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But there could be a different. I mean, I'm just wondering about the. Um, yeah, the power law index can be different. Yes, I think that that's what we're trying to uh, to narrow down. Okay. Yeah. So, Sarah, very, very remarkable talk again. I have a question for you. I was very interested by the the constraint that you uh, made about the the possibility of a jet, and you said that if there is a jet then it uh, needs to be face on and at a maximum angle of uh, 20 degrees if i remember correctly so i was wondering if, if there is a way with the eht to actually rule out the presence of a jet or the best that you can do is to constrain the inclination angle um with the eht uh... I think it would be very difficult to rule out a jet completely um, with the EHT, um, except um, maybe if we look at the magnetic field configuration and polarization, um, we would be able to tell if it was a kind of um, this jet base magnetic field or disk magnetic field. Um, and in that case, if we had, say, if we had a face on, you know, um, black hole shadow, so similar to M87, we could um, look at the um, GRMHD predictions and polarization for disks and jets, and we could maybe tell them apart, although um, I'm not sure what the, um, what our dynamic range is in polarization, so <laughs> it would be, yeah, it may be possible, but it would be difficult, I think. Because uh, we're really in the optically thin regime with the EHT, so the diffuse emission from a jet would be very, very faint. And we, right now, we don't have, we don't even have the dynamic range to see the jet in M87 in our EHT images, and we know it's there. So for Sajay Star, I think it would be even more difficult. Also, the black hole is variable, so even. Yeah, even if we get some kind of faint jetty feature, I think we'll have a very hard time deciding whether it's real. Okay, thank you. So, any other questions? No, I don't see any. So let's thank our speaker again, and um, I'll see you next week. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much.